Yes, indeed, there does come a time for the end of emergency powers, but this nation is not at that time. 48 of our 50 states still operate with a governor with emergency powers. What Senate File 4 proposes to do is not to work with the legislature, but to provide the majority in the Senate with an ability to veto and block the governor's emergency powers. If 48 out of 50 states in this country, 53 of our 55 territories, and our president still operate under emergency powers, then I ask you members, is this the time when it looks to you like emergency powers need to come to an end? Let's take the great state of Texas. That governor just removed the mask mandate, and I think you'll hear some comments today about public health. But what you'll also find out is that the governor of Texas maintains his emergency powers. So it's hard to find support for emergency powers in Minnesota by looking at what's going on in the rest of the country. But in reviewing Senate File 4, I certainly heard this word a lot, gridlock. What Senate File 4 would require is that both chambers of the legislature agree to extend the governor's emergency powers. I thought I heard the expression political allies refusing to hold the executive branch accountable. I think what you mean is the other chamber agrees with the exercise of emergency powers. That's a little different. In Senate File 4, the requirement of both chambers to agree is the biggest flaw in the bill. Emergencies are a really bad time to say to the public, hey, we need to give three days notice to the legislature so they can hold committee hearings because then they might provide relief. Ask yourself, members, if we had an outbreak of a new COVID variant in Bemidji, for example, and the people in Bemidji and the hospitals wanted to have immediate vaccine testing sent out, do you think they'd be happy to hear, well, sorry, we have to give three days notice? I don't think that they would. Gridlock in Minnesota is a real risk, especially because of divided government. I think we should talk about the CARES Act funding that produced gridlock or perhaps HAVA fund, but I'll save that for other members. So we propose Senate File 4. Well, what could possibly go wrong? Well, let's look to the great state of Alaska. As many of you may know, Alaska experienced an end to their emergency powers and almost immediately blew it by not understanding the implications, including federal funding. The Republican-controlled Senate did not extend emergency powers. They went to the governor, Dunleavy, and they lost money for food stamps, for airport screening, for temporary housing. The state couldn't set up emergency treatment centers. They couldn't manage the vaccines for small towns and boroughs. And they had to send a resolution to the governor saying, please extend your emergency powers. So this sounds to me like a state that recognizes the implications. And the majority leader in the Alaska Senate Meshed said, please, for God's sake, let's tell the governor that we need him to create a new order. This, to me, sounds like we're starting to answer a question about when does it come a time. Our neighbor in South Dakota still exercises emergency powers. And to the Alaska Hospital Association, the CEO said, this is a mess, a complete mess. Let's not have that mess here in Minnesota, members. Let's vote no. It's also impractical to end the emergency powers. As many of you know, this relates to our federal emergency disaster funding. That's funding that comes from the federal government to help states when they have disaster-related expenditures. To look at how that affects Minnesota, we need to go all the way back to seven days ago on March 9th, when the Legislative Advisory Commission approved 36 million in federal funds to come to Minnesota. And what about the expediency? How would we find the uh, ability to negotiate leases for the Mall of America or the Vikings facility to put out uh, vaccines? Would we do an RFP in, say, 30 days from now? I believe the question is, what is the voice of the people? The voice of the people elects governors, elects representatives, elects senators. And the balance of the three branches is so that we can do the best for the people of Minnesota. And as I looked at Minnesota, I started to see a pattern that it seemed to me suggested Minnesota's pretty lucky. We've saved over 5,000 lives when compared to states with higher death rates. We're ranked number one by Save the Children for Children's Health during COVID. Number six in vaccine distribution efficiency by the CDC. That means we put out the sixth best percentage of the vaccines that were given into the arms of Minnesotans. No wonder our results are so good. And by the way, this administration is often referred to as one person making the laws. It's not one person, it's an administration. 
The administration is supported by appointees like the incomparable Commissioner of Health, Jan Malcolm, and staff members throughout the administration that help make great decisions. None of us would suggest that our Secretary, Cal Ludeman, isn't of great value to the President of the Senate, but that's an unelected person for whom we empower the ability to help us elected officials make good decisions. So where do we go from here? Well, again, it's no secret that we've offered to sit down and negotiate out the emergency powers resolutions, the executive orders that relate to things like vaccines, like homelessness, like testing, all those things that we could work on together. If we wanted to work on it together, we would be sitting down and working on it together. And I was reminded by a good friend this weekend of a metaphor that I think speaks best to what the people of Minnesota wants for us to get the emergency powers ended and to get on the other side of the pandemic. Let's land this plane safely, working together, not jump out without a parachute. Thank you, Mr. President.